The thumbs up has been given. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ed Hyland, and I will be your MC for the general sessions over the next several days. I'm also one of the hosts for Wind Power TV, so we hope you get a chance to check that out online as well. Uh, we would really like to thank all of the 2017 sponsors. Their generous contributions support AWIA's efforts to promote and advance the wind energy industry in the United States and drive education and business development opportunities for those in the workforce. AWIA wants to recognize top terawatt sponsors. AWS True Power, acquired in 2016 by UL, is a global renewable energy firm providing quality, innovative energy engineering and advisory services to project developers and operators, investors, utilities, government agencies, as well as manufacturers. Staying true to their roots, they remain accessible and keenly responsive to the needs of their clients. Together with UL, AWS True Power offers a portfolio of extensive solutions and data tools, making them an even larger powerhouse in renewable energy. Their goal is to empower trust in renewable energy throughout the project life cycle and across the supply chain. DNVGL is a leading global energy and renewables consultancy and independent testing authority. With over a 150 year heritage in the power sector, the company's services span the entire spectrum from policy to use, including renewables, energy efficiency, power generation, T&D and energy related testing, inspection and certification. Its customers include household names and production, supply and end use of energy, as well as manufacturers, financiers, governments, and corporations. DNVGL operates the world's largest short circuit laboratory and a state-of-the-art energy storage test and commercialization center. GE Renewable Energy is a $10 billion startup that brings together one of the broadest products and service portfolios of the renewable energy industry. Combining onshore and offshore wind, hydro, and innovative technologies such as concentrated solar power and more recently turbine blades, GE Renewable Energy has installed more than 400 plus gigawatts capacity globally to make the world work better and cleaner. With more than 22,000 employees present in more than 55 countries, GE Renewable Energy is backed by the resources of the world's first digital industrial company. Their goal is to demonstrate to the rest of the world that nobody should ever have to choose between affordable, reliable, and sustainable energy. Siemens Gamesa Renewable Energy, with a worldwide installed capacity of 75 gigawatts, Siemens Gamesa Renewable Energy has a presence in more than 90 countries and a team of more than 27,000 employees worldwide. Its end-to-end -end value chain present encompasses onshore and offshore wind turbine design, manufacturing and installation, as well as cutting edge service solutions. AWIA also would like to recognize Siemens Gamesa Renewable Energy as the general session sponsor. These companies and all of the gigawatt, megawatt, kilowatt, and event sponsors, whose names you've seen scrolling on some of the slides, are sincerely thanked for their generous efforts of AWIA's efforts. Wind Power has a brand new attitude. Now generating over 84 gigawatts of electricity, the U.S. wind power industry has become a major player in the energy sector. With a brand new attitude focused on new ideas and proven concepts, Wind Power has become the biggest, fastest, and cheapest path to a more sustainable energy sector. Prepare to witness this brand new attitude here at Wind Power 2017. I am back, and for those of you who are joining us virtually, welcome. It is an honor to be here and to take part in such a dynamic, exciting industry. And yes, for the very first time, AWIA is live streaming this morning's program. So be sure to text your colleagues back in the office, let them know they can still be part of this morning's fun right here in Anaheim at windpowerexpo.org. And while, since I know you're all reaching for your phones, while you've got it out, if I give you one piece of advice for navigating this huge event, download the app now. Look for AWIA events in the app store so you can really have access to the latest schedule, speaker lineups, exhibitor lists, presentations, and much more. And now, onto the program. This morning's general session 
and our education throughout the day revolves around one of the most important pillars of AWEA's mission, and that's to support the implementation of wind energy through work that encourages transmission infrastructure, safe siting policies, standards setting, efficient operations and maintenance, and a safe, healthy, and robust workforce. We'll start this morning off by hearing from those leading the charge for the association, and then we'll finish with a panel of industry leaders discussing implementation of wind energy into the 2020s, opportunities and policy reform, emerging political issues, and much, much more. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the CEO of AWEA. With his past experience uh, facing alligators and hippos while kayaking in Africa, it is really no wonder that he's done a great job navigating the murky, challenging waters in Washington, D.C., as well as across the states. Please welcome Mr. Tom Kiernan. Thank you very much, Ed. Thank you, Ed, and good morning, everybody. Welcome to Wind Power 2017, and welcome to first place. Does first place feel good to you? Does first place, Sandy, that works for you? I will say, I kind of like first place. Wind power is now the number one renewable energy resource in this country, having passed hydroelectric in generating capacity this past year. This morning, I want to talk about how we got to first place and how we're going to stay in first place for a long, 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 long time. Getting to first place starts with delivering on our promises. And over the last couple of years, we have made a few promises. We said that we could reliably add more wind on the grid. Well, now we have five states that are delivering over 20% of their electricity by wind energy and doing it 365 days of the year. And at times this past year, ERCOT and SPP provided over 50% of their electricity from wind energy. So on reliability, we delivered. We said that with stable tax policy, we could create jobs in America. Well, we started 2016 with 88,000 jobs. We ended 2016 with over 100,000 jobs. And within that, we started 2016 with 21,000 manufacturing jobs, and we grew that to 25,000 manufacturing jobs at the end of 2016, and we're projected to grow another, another 8,000 manufacturing jobs in the next four years. So on jobs, we delivered. We said in Orlando two years ago that we wanted to hire more vets. Well, we are now hiring vets at 50% greater, faster than the national average. On vets, we delivered. We said that if you give us a level playing field, we will invest more in America, especially rural America. Well, over the last two years, each of the last two years, we have invested $14 billion each year, most of that in rural America where it's economically challenged. And we're projected over the next four years to catalyze another $85 billion of economic activity, mostly in rural America. So on rural investment, we delivered. We said that we could launch an offshore wind industry here in the United States. Well, this last year, Block Island came online. On offshore wind, we delivered. So my first point this morning is we are delivering on our promises and on the vision of an affordable, reliable, job-creating, and clean wind energy. The fact that we are delivering on our promises is one of the reasons that our theme for this year's wind power is brand, a brand new attitude. We are big. We are reliable, we are delivering on our promises, and we're not just here to stay, we are here to grow and grow and grow. To put even our current size in perspective, we are as big, the, the wind turbine sales, generator sales, are as big as the annual revenue of the NFL. We're bigger than boats, we're bigger than guns and ammo. Heck, we are bigger than boats and guns and ammo combined. And there are big brands, both the traditional 
older brands in America and the newer brands that are buying a lot of wind energy. Amazon just opened up North Carolina to utility scale wind. Every bottle of Tide detergent is now 100% wind powered. And General Motors recently announced that their enormous assembly line down in Texas that builds most of their large SUVs, that entire facility, will be 100% wind powered by 2018. So our brand new attitude is one of confidence that we are big and we are growing. Our brand new attitude is also one of knowing that wind power of today is not like wind power of 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. Despite what some with outdated views might say, industry experts who've been studying the grid for years are saying that wind is reliably added to the grid. Wind is strengthening the grid resiliency. Wind is not the primary cause of, of coal and nuclear retirements. And the frame of focusing on baseload power or somehow putting baseload power on a pedestal, that is yesterday's thinking. The University of Texas came out a, with a report last week, and I want to read a paragraph, a summary paragraph from that report. Quote, it said, despite concerns to the contrary, incorporating wind and solar into the grid along with fast ramping natural gas, smart market designs, and integrated load control systems will lead to a cleaner, cheaper, and more reliable grid. The future of the grid is about competitive, affordable, flexible, clean power, and that plays to our strengths. These and other facts justify the belief we are number one and we are adding to the economic and national security strengths of America. But now I want to talk less about our past and talk more about our future. AWEA doesn't do projections, so we look to some of the other analysts out there, and most analysts are saying that the plus or minus 8,000 megawatts that we have deployed the last couple years will continue, that we will very likely continue deploying for the next several years plus or minus 8,000 megawatts. But some of those projections are also saying, hey, there may be a downturn or a decline in the 2020s with wind deployment. Well, here's what we are going to do to once again prove our critics wrong. We are going to keep driving down the levelized cost of energy by increasing productivity, reducing costs, reducing down time, and using big data. We will get more efficient with more training programs, more industry standards, more job certifications, more member webinars, greater use of AWEA's Market Database Pro, and these are all programs that AWEA is invest investing more time and energy with you in building. We will ensure that the five-year PTC phase-down deal is protected. We will build more transmission and integrate wind on the grid better by improving the market rules. We will work with the Department of Interior on regulatory reform so that we're able to more efficiently, more quickly, uh, site wind farms out throughout the country. And we will be advocating in each and every state for a level playing field so that we are able to compete in each and every state. We have a lot to do, but based on our past performance, we will deliver. Now, before I share a few closing remarks, I do want to introduce a new member of our team at AWEA. We've hired a new senior vice president for government and public affairs who will be involved in a number of the efforts that I just mentioned, leading a few of them. If I can ask Amy Farrell to please stand up and be recognized, I want all of you to be able to find her and chat with her in the next couple of days. Welcome, Amy. 
So now let me close with one final and really important thought. None of these key tasks that will enable us to keep delivering on our promises and stay at number one, none of them will happen without your active involvement and without the active involvement of your colleagues 100,000 strong that are in the wind industry. We need your engagement and your leadership. So please, get involved in the AWEA committees. Sign up to be on our email advocacy list. Join us in lobbying in Washington, D.C. or in state capitals throughout the country. Or give to WINPAC or to your political action committee. But get involved one way or another because together and only together will we stay in first place and keep delivering on our promises. Thank you very much. It's now my great pleasure to introduce the new chair of the AWEA board. He is the president and CEO of EDF Renewable Energy and is responsible for Canada, US, and Mexico. He doesn't get a lot of sleep. I've tried to interrupt his sleep, but no, he has been working because Tristan is spending a lot of time helping us, working with us to design and make the future bright for this industry. Please welcome Tristan Grimbert, President and CEO of EDF Renewables. Thank you, Tom. Tristan. Great speech. Yeah. Well, the delivery. Thank you, Tom. Talking about delivering speeches. Welcome. Welcome to my home state of California, a state where wind and solar originated and are still booming, and a state that, to some extent, or to a large extent, previews the future of renewable energy. A state where in 1985, a Danish firm founded a wind company that is now EDF Renewable Energy and EDF Renewable Services that operates 10 gigawatts in North America and has built 1.3 gigawatts alone in California. So I, I refer to California as my home, but as you all know, I'm not exactly native. When I arrived on January 1, 2005 to start a new life in the US, I was young and energetic and I had an equally young family with two toddlers and an eight-year-old. None of them spoke a word of English. And on that day, as we were heading towards Palm Spring in a minivan rental with 10 70-pound suitcases and 10 large carry-on that you cannot see on planes anymore, filling the space all the way to the ceiling, to be honest, I couldn't tell the difference between a megawatt and a megawatt hour. Yet, I vividly recall the feeling of excitement of starting a new professional career at the top uh, win IPP and o &M company called at the time Enexco. I also recall the satisfaction of feeling that I will be contributing to fight climate change and save our planet from the detrimental effect of climate change. Fast forward 12 years. I stand here today as an American citizen in front of you, a great assembly of bright people dedicating passion and science to the wind industry. I am really humbled and thrilled and honored to be represented the American Wind Energy Association for the year to come as chairman. Thank you for your confidence. Thank you. So 12 years later, we are still the same industry, yet a lot has changed, as Tom was saying. In California and all over the US, we are providing affordable, reliable, clean energy. And we have, as Tom said, delivered on our promises. Indeed, today, in many parts of the country, we are the lowest cost energy resources. And we have reached high level of penetration. However, with our successes came some new challenges. Management of the grid itself needs to evolve to address new those new challenges, like low gas price, basis risk, curtailment, uh, native, negative pricing, all those challenges are very manageable in the grid of the future. Some call that the smart grid. And those challenges are manageable because the grid will evolve more in the next 10 years than it has in the last 100. The grid of the future will be distributed, 
which means more customer choice, decarbonized and digital. It will be agreed where artificial intelligence will be able to compile in real time huge amount of data coming from multiple generation assets and low points. From the solar panels on my roof in San Diego, from the wind farm in the Mojave Desert, from the monitoring system of the uh, air conditioning here in this convention center, from the electrical vehicle you parked in the parking lot here, from the battery pack in the supermarket a block away from here, from all those points, we will be able to manage in real time and dynamically control the grid. The agility of the grid of the future is a tremendous opportunity for wind. The grid can manage wind. There is no question about that anymore. The real challenge for our industry is actually to adapt to new power condition. Price volatility will tremendously reduce. The um, storage cost will be affordable. And even more importantly, the price of energy will remain low for the foreseeable, for foreseeable future. To compete in this low energy price environment and for any form of generation, not just wind, but any form of generation to be built, five things need to happen. Two relates to transmission and three to market structure. First, the ITPs, utilities, FERC, RTOs, ISOs need to cooperate to strengthen the grid in two ways. It starts with grid expansion. Tom mentioned it. The US grid needs more wire. It's aging. It is that simple. We need new wire to link load and renewable resources in order to provide grid stability. But also, and as importantly, we need more sophisticated and, more, and fairer market rule for the ISO to be able to better control and manage the new generation assets while still preserving the legacy investment. Secondly, the market needs to continue to evolve to, final, to financially recognize the other attributes that wind projects bring to the grid. For example, and first, ancillary services. Today we see that MISO and PJM are starting to compensate for reactive power, for example. Second, capacity payment. Very important to have in the future market structure with a low price environment. And lastly, of course, carbon reduction, one that is dear to my heart, as some of you know. These value streams need to be recognized and compensated for. I know it sounds like a long-range vision of what the market structure needs to be, but this is my vision, Tom, of what I want AWEA to pave the road for. So I know, guys, today we're all very busy competing, building, financing, our project for the PTC window. And I know that the political context is a little bit challenging. However, and that's why I'm sure you're asking yourself, how do we do that? How do we change those market structure? And to be honest, I do not have a solution today, but I do have a path. And that path came, came to me in February at the uh, Wind Power Capital Hill event when we are meeting numerous members of Congress. And I was observing their enthusiasm for a win, and I was thinking, what does, mean really, what does win really mean to them? So I'm asking you, what does win mean to you? Is that energy independence? Is that a drought-resistant crop that brings year after year a dollar to farmers and send their kids to college? Is that dozens of American manufacturing and construction jobs? Is that the best and last defense against climate change? Or is it just clean, affordable energy? For me, for all of us, it has to be all of the above. And that is the path. The path is not to choose a reason to support wind versus another. The path is not to determine in advance a political policy vehicle. The path is to capitalize on all the support the American people are giving us. 85% are in favor of more wind. 
The path is to be truly multi-partisan in our heart and soul. This is the brand new attitude. Now is the time to embrace and channel all forms of support that can help us forge the policies and regulation that are needed for new revenue streams to continue to help WIN to thrive. A brand new attitude is that WIN works for America, for all Americans. Thank you very much. So as Tom said, WIND has uh, hit this year an uh, incredible milestone of you know, having more than 100,000 employees in, in the US in 50 states. Um, and, and our growth is really the result of uh, a bipartisan support from all levels of government. Our keynote speaker today exemplify the crucial role that states can play in our industry, in, in our growth. He's a state leader of the largest state in the union, the sixth largest economy in the world, and thanks to his leadership, renewable energy can someday, here in California, provide more than 50% of the power. It is my honor to introduce California State President Pro Tem, Kevin DeLeon, whose leadership has inspired so many states to grow more renewable energy. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate nice you. Thank you. Nice to see you. Thank you so very much, uh, Tristan, for the very wonderful introduction of my person. Uh, good morning to each and every one of you. It's an honor to be here at the American Wind Energy Association trade show, uh, to be here with so many leaders, so many innovators at the forefront of the clean energy economy, but specifically here today at the forefront of wind technology. And there will be no doubt be so many challenges ahead for your industry, for local, state, federal and even international climate policy. But I do take comfort in the California example because I believe strongly that it's a model for the rest of the nation as well as the world. Now under both Democratic and Republican administrations, going back to Ronald Reagan's days as governor of the great state of California, California has consistently pushed for cleaner air, water as well as energy more efficient buildings and vehicles, and strong protections for our cherished natural landscapes as well as resources. These efforts were driven by necessity, not by ideology. Californians were literally sick of breathing dirty air as well as drinking dirty water, and the consequences were holding back our economy. By following the science and taking common sense steps to protect consumers, wildlife, as well as our air and water, we've turned some of our biggest environmental challenges into incredible economic opportunities. We've implemented some of the most ambitious clean air policies in the nation, including tailpipe emission standards that have become the national model. We have led the charge to remove lead from gasoline, and we have asked for and received nearly 150 waivers under the Clean Air Act to pursue even stronger policies to fight to tackle pollution. Now, since we passed AB 32, the Global Warming Solutions Act of 2006, our GDP has grown by over 40 percent, and our economy is now 39 percent less carbon intensive than it was back in 1990. In the last two years, we have passed more ambitious clean energy and emissions uh, reduction targets, the strongest, in fact, in the nation, my Senate Bill 350 as well as Senate Bill 32. Now, these efforts have helped save American households billions of dollars and avoided fuel and energy costs. And in fact, in spite of all of the doomsday rhetoric that we have heard over the years, Californians actually spend less energy than all but three states in America. Meanwhile, we're also reducing the pollution that is so harmful to our children, to our families, and our planet. And we've turned clean energy into a pillar of our economy that now employs over half a million Californians. In fact, and I want to underscore the following point. There are nearly 10 times as many people employed by the clean energy industry in California alone than there are coal mining jobs in the entire nation. Now, I want to underscore that point once again. 
there are nearly 10 times more jobs in the clean energy space in California alone than there are coal mining jobs in the entire nation in 2017, which is why President Trump's fossil fuel fetish is just not environmentally out of touch. Economically, it doesn't make any sense. The economics are, in fact, out of whack. So we are not holding back the free market. In fact, we're pushing it forward. We're disrupting the status quo, canalizing investment, innovation, as well as competition, and charting a much more prosperous and sustainable economic path. Our commitment to a strong environmental protection is the leading reason why California remains the nation's capital of innovation. Now, we didn't grow into the sixth largest economy and the epicenter of innovation by embracing alternative facts or pseudoscientific nonsense. In this state, we make our public policy based on facts as well as science. There are only five other economies in this world larger than the state of California. The United States as a whole in the aggregate, number two, China, number three, it is Japan, number four, Germany, number five, on a good day, depending on the fluctuations and the valuations of the sterling, the pound, the United Kingdom, and number six is the great state of California. Now, if you're remotely interested, Tristan's former nation, France, is the number seven uh, largest economy in the world, but now he's an American citizen, and more importantly, he is a Californian, you know. At number eight, uh, it is Brazil. At number nine is a nation that's been in the news quite a bit and will probably will be so in the foreseeable future. It is Russia. And at number 10, it is Italy. So California's economy is larger than that of Vladimir Putin's Russia, to put this in context. So we are not going to allow one election to reverse generations of progress at the height of our historic diversity our scientific advancement, our economic output, and our sense of global responsibility. We know that just this past month, I introduced Senate Bill 100, which calls for 100% clean renewable energy for California by the year 2045. It's the most ambitious target in the world, especially for an economy that again dwarfs all but a handful of nations. But our experience so far offers very hard evidence that we can dramatically expand clean energy while also growing our economy and putting people to work. In fact, we have decoupled, we have delinked carbon from GDP. So it's no longer a question of if, it's only a question of when. SB 100, Senate Bill 100 accelerates the process. It speeds up my Senate Bill 350, 50% mandate for clean energy from the year 2030 to the year 2026. And it establishes a new RPS benchmark, Renewable Portfolio Standard, of 50% by the year 2030. It will entirely eliminate the need for fracking and fossil fuels in our electricity grid by the year 2045. Now, it is a very ambitious goal, no doubt, but I believe it is measured. And that approach will ensure that we have a flexible and reliable grid. We are in the very early stages now, as we will be very thoughtful as we deal with all the stakeholders, because we want to make sure that we get it right. But I want to make a few brief observations before I conclude. While it's certainly not very helpful that we have a very hostile Congress as well as administration, it won't be enough to halt the global momentum when it comes to clean energy. I'm very optimistic about the future for a few key reasons, chiefly for the reasons I had mentioned earlier, the power of state and local leadership. Secondly, is a growing international momentum, even among the largest polluters like China as well as India. China sees the writing on the wall. They're investing massive amounts of capital to try to take the lead as the world's superpower when it comes to clean energy. And unfortunately, we have a president of the United States who is serving the clean energy space on a silver platter to the Chinese as we speak in real time. But finally, and perhaps more importantly, is the incredible innovation and the leadership of the private sector. That is each and every one of you here today and those who are witnessing via the webinar. The technological breakthroughs happening right now, but especially here in California, 
will reshape global markets for generations to come. Over 60 percent, over 60 percent of all new energy generation in the United States was from wind as well as solar. A growing list of Fortune 500 companies like Google, Facebook, Nestle, as well as Walmart have all set their goals to have 100 percent clean power. And a growing number of politically conservative states like Iowa, Texas, as well as Oklahoma generate 20 percent of their power from the wind. As energy costs continue to decline, demand will increase, employment will grow, and it doesn't make a difference if you're a Democrat or Republican or agnostic altogether. Putting people to work in jobs that are real and tangible where they can pay for the roof over their child's head, put the clothes on their child's back, and food on the table matters for most Americans. This, this political dynamic power sh shift will change quite dramatically. And in the meantime, we will continue to use every legal and political tool at our disposal to accelerate this process. Now, last thing I want to say, because I'm very proud of Tristan as well, too, for becoming a U.S. citizen and for becoming a Californian, because these are very extraordinary times in our country. And extraordinary times call for extraordinary action. So that's why we're accelerating our commitments and our goals to climate action not just statewide, not just regionally, nationally, but internationally. Today, with the Mexicans, with the Canadians, with the Germans, as well as the Chinese, we are continuously entering into agreements, exporting our climate technologies, our leadership and policies, while at the same time training the technicians and scientists from other parts of the world. So California will stand behind each and every one of you. Now, that's a principle that's bigger than partisanship, and more powerful than any president. And I promise you this, that in America's darkest hours will come some of our final moments. Now, California was not part of this nation when its history began, but we are clearly now the keeper of its future. With that, thank you very much. God bless you, and have a wonderful conference. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, for your very candid remarks. There are a couple of folks uh, that I would like to take just a moment to recognize here in the audience. Two people who have dedicated quite a bit of their time to ensure the content of the conference is as valuable and relevant to you all as it can possibly be. Can I please have a round of applause for Wind Power 2017 program co-chairs, Stephanie Kushner, President and CEO of Broadwind Energy, and Richard Jagarian, Vice President of Generation EDF Renewable Energy. Thank you so much for your very hard work. It's much appreciated. Now please enjoy a short video from our general session sponsor as we transition to this morning's panel.
Now I'd like to take a moment to welcome to the stage what has become an annual tradition and a crowd favorite here at Wind Power, our industry leaders who will dive into the issues facing wind energy implementation into the 2020s and beyond. I'm also pleased to introduce our moderator, Amy Harder. She is an energy reporter for the recently launched news outlet Axios. Prior to Axios, she reported on energy for the Wall Street Journal and National Journal. Please welcome Amy Harder and your industry leaders. Well, thank you, Ed, for that great introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone here in the room in Anaheim and everyone joining us online as well. Um, one logistical note, I encourage you to, to join in on the conversation on Twitter with the hashtag WindWorks. Now I want to introduce our panelists. Of course, you all know Tristan, who's already spoken this morning. Next to him, we have Karen Lane. She's the CFO of Onshore Americas for the Siemens Gamesa Renewable Energy. Next to her is Pete McCabe. He's the president and CEO of Onshore Wind for GE Renewable Energy. And next to him is Greg Wolf, the CEO of Leeward Renewable Energy. So uh, the last time this conference took place, I think most were probably assuming a President Clinton in the White House. I think most people in the entire world were making that assumption. My motto for 2017 is to make no more assumptions. Um, so in that regard, let's start off with a, a pithy question. Uh, if each of you could choose one word to describe how you're feeling and thinking about the Trump administration's position on renewable energy and wind in particular, what word would that be? Tristan? Open. Open? Mm -hmm. Nice. Karen? Interesting. I think um, monitoring. What was that? Monitoring. I'll give it a hopeful. How about that? Mm -hmm. Positive spin. You know, these people are a lot more hopeful than a few of the people I asked last night. After a couple of drinks, maybe people got a little bit um, less hopeful. Um, but. There have been some positive signs. Of course, um, Energy Secretary Rick Perry has been a big wind proponent and oversaw a huge wind expansion in Texas. Um, what's the one thing that you're looking for the most out of this new administration? Um, Is it the one-word answer as well? No, yeah. no, no. You can go more than one. Objectivity. You're sticking to succinct. That's nice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, 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 the point is, I think, I'm not sure that the administration has really defined yet uh, a policy for vis-a-vis -vis wind. And uh, I think they're still open. We, having, uh, we are having a lot of meetings uh, with uh, the, uh, the various uh, uh, officials that are being appointed as the administration is struggling to fill the, the various seats in the administration. And uh, we have a wide range of reaction, I think. Some are not very favorable to wind. Some, as you mentioned, uh, Secretary Perry, are very favorable. And a lot are trying to learn more. And I think this is a we ask job to provide that information so that we can try to, clearly the, the administration has an agenda, a pro-business agenda, and we are a strong business. And we are hopeful that, uh, and open that we can, based on objective facts, that we can uh, help the administration to continue to support WIN. Great. Karen, what about you? Well, I think that one thing for me would be that when Congress passed a bipartisan extension of the PGC in 2015, and I think it's really critical that remains in place because a lot of uh, companies made very strategic decisions and made investments accordingly to how that extension was put in place. Yeah, look, I'd, I'd say open-minded. I think uh, tax reform, uh, infrastructure investments, and regulatory reform done well can be terrific for the U.S. economy, for jobs, and for win. Yeah, I'm focused on that regulatory reform piece, right? I mean, I think that's a little bit, uh, not that we want to position wind as an opponent of the administration, but sort of that judo strategy a little bit in the sense that that's been a big push for them. And I think there's a number of areas where I think practically we should make some progress on some of the regulation that has affected us, I think, adversely over the last three, four years on siting, operational issues, environmental. And so if we could wisely tamp down some of those issues to good outcomes, uh, first, and then we can tackle some of the other issues later. I think that would be a great sort of uh, outcome for the industry. Great, um, and, and you've, you've hinted at this a little bit, and Tristan, in your remarks as well. There's been some widespread concern about the Energy Department's study on the reliability of the electric grid, whose substance and comments by the um, Energy Secretary seem to favor coal and natural gas and nuclear power over renewables. Um, what are your concerns about that study, and, and what are some concrete 
um, results from that that could impact you? Or do you think that it's more sort of messaging and, and could not have that much of an impact on the day-to-day -day and the growth of the industry? So I, I think that the, um, it all depends what the Department of Energy wants to do with the study. Um, the, the concern about how to address capacity for the uh, fossil fuel load is, is very real. And I think it has to be addressed, but it has to be addressed in a comprehensive market reform while looking at all the facts. And today, wind provides some capacity, not much, but some, provides great ancillary services, provides decarbonization. And it does, for me, it does make sense that you try to revisit the market rules, as I was saying in, in, in my speech, and in a way that allows the various uh, generation to continue to uh, basically evolve towards the grid of the future. I, what I'm afraid of is that decision would be, that the conclusion would be made in advance, and I'm not saying it's the case, because as I said, the, uh, the department is actually collecting information as we speak, uh, but I don't want to have conclusion too quickly. I think it's very important that they take the time to think that through and really design the future market rules that we need for every uh, technology to thrive. Karen, do you have any comments on that study? Well, um, I think he's brought up a lot of good points. I hate to sort of speculate too much because there's just, I think, so much information being passed around right now. Uh, we are involved, as, as I think all of us on here, trying to help educate uh, the administration um, on the roles that WIND does play and, and can bring to the party. So I'm, I'm hopeful that, again, talked earlier about being objective and listening to the information that they receive. I just echo Karen's point. I, I think objectively the, the facts are compelling. Right? The American public wants more, more wind. Everybody wants a reliable grid. The grid is reliable enough today. I think technology coming in with digital, technology with storage will help amplify that out, and I think we'll come out with the right outcome. Greg, any last comments on that? Uh, you know, I mean, I think I agree with the question that Governor or Secretary Perry has asked. I think the, I would argue that he sort of framed it maybe a little bit um, one-sided, and so I think that's a fair criticism as we, as we see it play out. I want to ask one more question about the federal landscape, um, which of course has changed so dramatically since President Trump won. Now, of course, today the budget is coming out. The budget is less important, I think, um, at least the, the, the budget proposal from the administration, given Congress is very unlikely to pass it in any um, form close to what the President has proposed. But one other thing that Congress has been talking about, which Karen, you hit on, um, is that Congress may tackle comprehensive tax reform, which some say could jeopardize the current deal that was put in place at the end of 2015 for these tax credits, the production tax credit for wind and also the investment tax credit for solar. Um, so another pithy uh, question. On a scale of 1 to 10, um, 1 being not at all and 10 being a necessary component, how important is this current deal um, to your business plans and investment plans over the next five to ten years? Tristan? I think I can answer for all ten. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I also think when you, the longer term you make it, you know, administrations come and go, things change, we adapt. I mean, we do tend, as a business, we'll adapt, so um, I'm a little more hopeful that, you know, working together as we're trying to do with the administration, that positive things will come out and it won't be a 10 for 10 years. <laughs> Can you pick a number? Please? Yeah, I don't look, I'd, I'd say 10 too. I, I think, you know, to, to make investments, we need a stable, reliable, you know, political landscape. As long as it's stable and reliable, we can all thrive out there. If it's not stable, it really puts us all in, in a bind. So I think that's it's a 10. If it's a 10, it's because it's stability. Greg, what about you? You know, for us, I mean, my business, we've got an operational portfolio that's got some age on it. So I think for that piece, it's not as big of impact, but we certainly are trying to grow this business as a lot of people in this room. I think for that, it's clearly a 10 plus uh, as far as the, ex you know, the extension, the deal that was cut. I think that that needs to be preserved. I think the broader tax reform really is the bigger question. Do any of you think that, are any of you planning to try to ask Congress to extend the, the production tax credit more after this current deal? broader than what this current deal did, the five-year? Personally, I, th I think that, sorry to answer all the time. Greg, go ahead. Well, as the chairman of the board, you should answer this question, right? <laughs> so I, I think that the, um, uh, so the answer to your question is no. We're not planning to ask for an extension. extension. Uh, the bigger issue for me is, is having fair market rules. But as I said, you know, 
protect legacy investments and plan for the future for the grid that we want to have, which will be much more agile, much more decarbonized, much more digital, and much more distributed. So I think that we have, to, we have time. The nice thing about the PTC window is that we have four, five, six years where, and we see declining costs, so we have time to plan. It is the right time to, look, to take the time to look at all the facts and plan what is going to look like. What are the market rules? Honestly, rewarding paying just for energy, for electrons, and not recognizing the other value attributes that generation, power generation equipment are bringing doesn't make sense. You're just paying one dimension, and if you want to have a balanced system, you need to recognize the value of each one of them. Great. Well, um, as Washington has been um, adjusting to the new administration, a lot else has been going on in the industry. I want to switch um, briefly to some of the um, news on the, the merger front. Um, so Karen and Pete, I know your companies have both been part of mergers and acquisitions lately. Both that were inked um, just a couple of months, a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago. Siemens and Gamesa, whose combined power puts you active in some 90 countries. Um, and then GE requiring LM Wind um, with a similar global reach. Um, we hear a lot of talk about big oil and big coal. Is this the beginning of big wind? And why was this good for your companies? And in five years, do you see a consolidation like this even more so across the industry? Karen, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, well, I think most industries sooner or later go through some sort of a consolidation as the market rules change and things. You know, so I think we're in that phase right now for Latin wind. For uh, Gamesa and Siemens, it was a really a, a very logical choice. Uh, we're very uh, balanced geographically. You mentioned 90 countries. Uh, we're also in 30 states within the U.S. Uh, the, we have a very um, broad portfolio. We have a nice order backlog of over 10 billion. Um, we think we bring very good um, synergies to each other because where we're, we have a heavier pre presence in North America, they had a pre heavier presence in, in other parts of Europe and Asia. And so it just made sense and we're really looking forward to uh, what that means for us to be together. Pete, so what was GE's thinking in this, yeah, in this look, purchase? I'd say first at the macro level, there's a lot of capacity out there, and I think there's going to be more consolidation, more hyphenated OEMs out there in the, you know, in the distant future. I think for us, anytime we can find you know, scale or technology that helps us lower our customers' LCOE, we're going to make, make those kinds of investments. And you know, it's difficult to be in the wind business without being you know, excellent with blades. LM is is excellent blades and we, you know, it's a compelling uh, proposition for us and, and I think ultimately for, for our customers out there. Now Greg, you're kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum as a, as a smaller company, relatively speaking, to, to these companies with huge global reaches. How are you operating in this environment that is increasingly consolidated and do you think you'll be merging with anybody soon? Well, I mean, not to be Captain Obvious, but I think scale matters in this business, right? And so I think the, you've seen, as you just talked about, the, the technology providers are consolidating because the investment required there, I think, to be successful as we keep driving efficiency uh, through the business and costs down are there. For us, as a, like a lot of folks here that are owners and operators of, of assets, scale matters. And so I think, yeah, it's great that we're, you know, a 1,500 megawatt sort of portfolio and that in... You know, I was thinking about, for a lot of familiar faces in the room, you know, 2011, uh, you know, that would have been sort of a top 10 uh, owner in the industry. If you look at, we've grown 75% megawatts in the U.S. since then, um, yet I think the number 10 player in the top 10 Bragawatt list is, is doubled in, in size. And I think, so there's already been some consolidation that's happened in the industry, and I think it's both... Uh, a good thing and an eventuality, right? So for us, yeah, we are wanting to grow our existing portfolio and I think some of that could come through more M&A or consolidation approach. One common talking point that we hear out of the administration is how important it is to be um, made in America. Um, do you think some of these acquisitions are going to enable the, the industry to, to have more manufacturing plants here in America? Um, or um, is there not a direct correlation there? Karen, do you want to start on that? Uh, well, I think with any level of investment, any business is going to do the same thing. They're going to look at the market and the, the opportunities there. They're going to look at how do you want to fill those? What is the cost of that associated with it? Uh, so yes, I do think that there might be some more opportunities for that, but time will tell as you know, we work our way through. You know, we have Safe Harbor and the 2020 PTC, you'll see. 
Just on, on this, I mean, in the late 2000s, at the booming time of the, the wind industry, we, uh, the market started to be big enough that we could, as a customer, demand from the suppliers to have manufacturing sites in the U.S. Wind turbines are big, they're heavy, they don't travel well. So it's an industry that is much more dependent on the health, the size, and the stability of its domestic market than on any other policy. We want, as a customer, to have the turbine manufacturer in the U.S. It's the case today for two-thirds. Then you have some components like electronics and things that have to are optimized and can travel well. I think that this is not wind will be localized. It, it is localized today. This is the debate that's behind us. The future will be local manufacturing. What percentage of your wind farms here in the U.S. are manufactured here? I think, well, I cannot answer, but they're, well, actually, I can. Pretty much all of them. They have some foreign components. But, I mean, you know in the car industry, the highest uh, low, uh, U.S. component is Toyota, right, mm -hmm. in the U.S. So it's a little bit the same thing. Siemens, Vestas, they manufacture in the U.S. Mm -hmm. They buy some parts here and there. But overall, the supply chain is localized largely. Mm -hmm. So, again, I think this is not really, this is past, this is from the last decade. Well, you, should tell, you should tell President Trump that then. That, he might like to, to hear. Happy to discuss with him anytime. Um, Tristan, I have another uh, question for you on, on a related topic. So I understand that your company is pairing up with a coal, uh, coal company in Kentucky um, to bring the first large-scale solar farm to Appalachia. Of course, we're in a, a wind audience here, but can you talk about how important state policies are um, to deciding where you invest? And could you see similar uh, deals like that being struck on the wind side of your company? So on the last question, yes, I can see a lot of that happening, a lot of, uh, of this kind of, uh, of, this kind of uh, deal happening where we, are, we represent a new, we represent a future. We are a new industry, new technology, and it is very natural that uh, wind project and solar project replace the local jobs of all technology. So I would even argue that when you look at the fact that 86% of wind projects are located in two Republican districts and most of them in the wind corridor, that pretty heavy, you know, manufacturing, all industry type, it is already happening. That, that specific story has got a lot of coverage because it's very emblematic of a solar company and a coal company. But overall, this is just one of the many examples in the history of the U.S. where a new technology, a new industry is replacing the old one. And we need to adapt, we need to have some empathy, we need to understand the local population and help them to convert to a new industry, and we'll be happy to do that. Great, so there's, also, there's already been a lot of talk uh, this morning about how wind power is increasingly able to be um, a baseload power itself that is very reliable into itself, that it can be, can, that wind can balance out wind. Um, as a reporter, it's my job to try to play devil's advocate no matter what the position is. So. In that vein, what's so bad about admitting that wind can be a big part of the electric pie, but that it can and should be complementary to other sources, such as natural gas? Nothing. I'm okay <laughs> with that. Yes? What about you, Karen? Uh, I'm okay with that, too. I have a fossil background before wind, so. <laughs> yeah, I'm okay with that. Uh, I, just, I just add, wind can be complementary to solar. You know, one of the things we're spending a lot of time on is a wind-solar hybrid turbine, and I think that really... Um, solves a lot of those issues. Greg, what about you? Do you think that there can be this, this you know, rhetoric that's complementary to both wind balancing out other sources of energy? Yeah, I think part of our focus needs to be that you know, wind is not um, a big problem as far as reliability and intermittency as much as some of the characterization has been made. But clearly, you know, I think whether it be the big utilities that have obligations to manage their grid or utility or grid operators, the all of the above has to be, I think, still part of the, the key message. And so, you know, it would be, I think, a mistake for us to even try to play offense and say, oh, we don't need more gas plants or uh, even to try to take on the coal plants. That's going to take care of itself, I think, with economics and other uh, drivers. So on this related note, you know, there's so much really um, fascinating technology here, and I hope to be able to see some of it after this panel. What, one area that I'm particularly interested in, which we've touched on a little bit, is the storage, of course, regarding the reliability, and then also transmission. So on the storage component, I mean, what is it that's on the horizon in your companies? That um, Is it more things like pump storage? Is it balancing wind with solar, for example? I mean, what are some of the, the top issues that you're looking at on the storage front? Okay. 
So uh, I think battery storage is key. Uh, it is, um, the, the, the cost curve is, is going down dramatically. It's not yet uh, large scale and, and, and full scale, but we can see that a little bit like uh, solar 10, 15 years ago, we can see the first inroad of some profitable application. And I think that's gonna grow from being you know, minuscule to small to pretty big and, and, and then big eventually. So battery storage is one. And then the second key thing, and there are multiple technology, but the second big, big one is really the, what's called the smart grid. I don't really like this term, but the ability to basically manage the uh, capacity on a transmission line based on, on the thermal readings. I mean, that's, with that, you can solve a lot of stability issue um, and uh, the demand side management. So the grid is going to be completely different 10 years from now, and we have to project ourselves. We do have time to prepare. We're still single digit market share for wind in terms of energy. So, you know, wind doesn't want to replace tomorrow every 100% of the uh, power generation in, in the US. We have, it's going to be a long evolution that we have to pre prepare now. And but clearly, battery storage and big data managed in real time to be able to have a dynamically managed grid is critical. Do you guys have any other thoughts was, on the storage? That was pretty complex. I think you covered almost everything there. And I think all companies are obviously either watching or investing, uh, really keeping our eye on it. It's, it's important to our future. Say it, it's, it's sort of all of the above. I, I think it's what Tristan said. I'd, I'd throw on pump storage. We're doing a lot of that around, around the world. And I think the hybrid uh, solar wind hybrid is not a pure storage opportunity, but it, it addresses the same issue. And I think it's, it's a suite of solutions. Greg? Well, I, I think the learning curve is still um, the one that's piece that has to make progress, right? I mean, solar, everybody thinks about a battery and a solar panel as a similar DC device, and you throw it out there, and, and you know, I think solar, for the most part, has proven that it sort of it does what it's supposed to do. The batteries, for many people in the room that have, have invested there, we have, the learning curve is still coming up the, the, the piece on just the pure performance piece beyond the fact that we need to go from $1,000 to maybe 350 today to 100 uh, down the road for the battery cost side. So, uh, but I do think it's going to be a trend. You look at the prediction, there's, what, 2,500 megawatts maybe today, I think, that are installed through the U.S. And the forecast is in the next 8, 10 years, you're going to have 10x that. So no doubt um, it is going to be a factor and it's going to be a benefit. Great. Well, we just have time for one more question, um, and it's going to be a, a concluding lightning round. Um, so if you can keep your answers quite short, I would appreciate it. Um, so, and I know we're not, none of us are official forecasters, so don't, so don't worry too much. You're not going to be um, stuck too much to what I'm about to ask you. But so wind accounted for about 8% of the operating electric generating capacity in the U.S. last year, more than any other renewable tech, um, source, according to the Energy Information Administration. Where do you think that number will be in the year 2067 or 50 years from now? So it's 8% today. Where do you think it'll be in 50 years? Um, well, higher. <laughs> Is that short enough? I don't know. Um, I think uh, in 67? That's a good question. I think it could be in the 40s. 40s? Karen? I think a lot of that may be due to what happens with our tax reform. If, we, if it's done well and properly, I think investments in, in, in this type of industry, as well as levelizing the playing field, I think it could be in the 40s as well. Yeah, look, I'd, I'd say it's going to be higher. I'm, I'm with Tristan. I, I, I've worked, at, I'm new to this industry. I've been here for three months, and I've won the jackpot. I mean, really won the jackpot. I, there's a lot of industries I've worked in that have asymptotic growth, right? And they're, you know, pick your industry, and I've, I've worked in a lot of we got exponential growth in this business. And I think as long as we continue to kind of win that LCOE race, I think the, the sky's the limit. I, I don't know that it's worth sort of prognosticating. It, it's, it's, it's let's go win 40s. that LCOE and, uh, and it'll, it'll reach its entitlement. You, it's going to be a long, You long think time. it's higher than the 40s? I think it can be, for sure. Yeah. What about you, Greg? Yeah, I'll give you a bullish answer. I, I'm going to give it a nice even 50, right? I think uh, <laughs> clearly I'm, I'm a buyer of uh, the technology advancements that you know, Karen and, and the pizza companies are making, and a lot of other people, you walk around the floor. Uh, I think, you know, while everyone sort of is very, uh, I think, focused and buys the message that solar has this better glide path, I think there's still going to be some bumps in the road there on whether it be short-term import policy or other things. And I, I just think it's going to continue to be uh, a march on and that maybe get to half. Great. 
Uh, well, I want to thank our panelists for this great um, panel. I think we ended on a good, hopeful note. And I want to hand things back to Ed. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to our wonderful panel. Amy, thank you so much as well. I hope you and the viewers online as well uh, had a, a chance to watch, listen, and learn perhaps from today's uh, session with our, with our industry leaders. We'll be back at the same place, same time tomorrow for another general session. The conference program, also located on the show floor, will begin at 1130. Use your conference app to find presentation times and locations and make sure to participate in the Beyond the Booth challenges for prizes. Finally, a little plug here for WindPower TV. We want your questions for Thursday's general session panel on demand drivers. So look for the WindPower TV cameras. We're going to be running around all over the place today here on the floor and about. We would like to videotape you asking your questions. Be ready for that. Enjoy the show. Thank you. There's a change in the air in Anaheim as wind power has a brand new attitude. Hi everyone, I'm Kimberly Bottom for Wind Power TV. And I'm Ed Highland. Welcome to Southern California and the 2017 Wind Power Conference and Exhibition. California has a real focus on renewable energy, making Anaheim a perfect fit for North America's largest annual wind energy conference. AWEA is maximizing convenience this year, making the show floor your one-stop shop for business, networking, and education. Here's what you can expect. More than 425 exhibiting companies more than 7,000 professionals, general sessions and panel discussions right on the exhibition floor. Education stations are back with sessions running all day, including 100 expert speakers and panelists, plus all access passes, special events, and all new extended hours make the Wind Power exhibition a truly shared experience for the wind industry. We've uh, run our business from Europe with offshore wind mainly and we've uh, had some success in the US on onshore wind. So to have a gathering where we get all of the clients that we would like to talk to uh, in one place is hugely important to us as a business. It's very important, especially with emerging technologies and uh, all the different companies that are gonna be here. It's gonna be great to get to meet everybody and learn. A huge part of this event is collaborating on ways to share what we know about wind energy with the general public. Wind energy is not alternative, it's mainstream, and more than 50% of all wind deployed last year came from some of the world's most iconic brands, like Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Walmart, GM, Ikea, and Yahoo, and that's just naming a few. To talk more about these advancements and this mission, Wind Power TV's Ed Highland is with AWEA CEO, Tom Kiernan. Ed? Thanks, Kim. Tom, good to see you once again. Uh, the sleeves are rolled up. You're, you're, you are ready for you are ready for business. Let's talk a little bit about this uh, this brand new attitude coming into AWEA. It is an exciting time for the wind industry. We are now the number one renewable power source in the country. So yes, we have a brand new attitude. We are big and. We're still growing. We grew last year 8,000 megawatts. We're going to grow another 8,000 megawatts this year. So we are big, we are bold, we are growing. 